So, welcome everybody to the functional impact of glycans and their curation. Um, we had a pre-meeting yesterday, and I see some of the faces uh, that I, we, we met yesterday, yeah. Thank you for coming today also. And I see some new faces. Um, it was a really great meeting. It was the first meeting to the best of our knowledge where we talked about the functional impact of glycans and, and how to curate them. And it was, it was a great learning experience, definitely for myself, and I heard from several others because uh, there are many resources who are curating information which is glycan related. It doesn't have to be exactly the glycans, but related. And how this information can be, or this curation efforts can be coordinated is, is number one thing. Number two is when users, non-glycobiologists or even glycobiologists come in to different resources, their favorite resource, whatever it might be, how they can traverse to other resources, right? So, th so those are the two major things. So one of the things that we also came up with is that uh, whatever our findings are from yesterday's meeting and this two-hour workshop today, uh, we would like to put together a white paper or some kind of an article, um, current status of curation in this space. Um, so if you are interested, so we will have uh, at least four three months or so, monthly meetings um, uh, online to discuss the potential of putting together an article. So there is a sign-up sheet here. Uh, we will pass it around. Uh, please put your name here and your email address. We will not share your email address other than emailing you on this list. Uh, if you were at the meeting yesterday, we already have your contact information. We will contact you, and if you want to opt out, you can opt out. Um, but that's how we are planning on proceeding on uh, getting at least this group together um, and maybe uh, have a, in the future have our second functional impact of glycan and curation um, meeting in the future. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, just provide a little bit of format for today's workshop. So uh, in the beginning, uh, Mike will give a presentation on a, just a glycan a overview of glycans, um, and and uh, that will set the stage for. There were four questions that we asked yesterday, uh, uh, and we will go over the responses we received from those four questions. And during the workshop, I'm hoping that uh, even for those of you who were there yesterday, you will have some additional comments in addition to what you gave yesterday, and we will put them in the slide, and you know, the slides are all in Google slide, and we can share those slides uh, with you. Um, so after those four questions, and, and uh, we, we will discuss them, but at the end, there will be some time also for open discussion, anything that we might have missed. So that's the format of uh, today's uh, workshop, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Mike. Thank you, Raja. <clears throat> My name is uh, Michael T. Meyer. Uh, I am not a biocurator, as far as I know. I am a glycobiologist by training, a glycochemist, an analytic chemist. Um, and one of the nice things about the, the meeting we had yesterday, the workshop, was we tried to bring in some biologists that have a long history of working with glycans to talk to bioinformaticists. It was a very, uh, I think, a very powerful combination. We had some support for our workshop from the Society for Glycobiology, which allowed us to bring in a world expert in glycobiology as an ambassador from the Society to our workshop. Dr. Ten Fazy from Imperial College, who's sitting in the front here, was that ambassador. And so her knowledge was very valuable. So I'm going to take uh, 15 minutes uh, or so and represent what I presented yesterday in terms of why people should care about glycans. Um, we're talking about glycans, we're talking about glycoscience and glycobiology as a major, in my mind, a major domain of the molecules of life, but I want to convince you all that that's the case. So uh, we're going to start with this uh, notion that every cell of every living organism is coated in carbohydrates. So on the left here is a picture of a yeast cell, and just this little bit in the middle is the yeast. All the stuff around it, all that clear space is carbohydrate. 
And especially for the fungal cells, this, this coating of carbohydrate is protective, but it also serves signaling functions and allows that fungus to go through various parts of its life cycle. Animal cells, no different. So this is a human blood cell. Here's the nucleus, the cytoplasm. The cell surface has been stained with a dye that shows the presence of carbohydrates. You can see this rich coating of carbohydrates at the surface. This is true of any cell in our bodies and any multicellular organism and even single cell uh, organisms as well. So this coating of carbohydrate has a name called the glycocalyx. We're going to focus on the glycocalyx, but I also want to take a, section, a second to point out that we now know there are carbohydrates in every compartment of the cell linked to proteins and linked to lipids. There's a modification of cytoplasmic and nuclear proteins, especially transcription factors, with a single monosaccharide, N-acetylglucosamine, which is very much like phosphorylation. It's dynamic. It comes on and off. So every compartment of the cell has a glycobiology associated with it. Particularly at the cell surface, the glycans infer protection in some contexts. They also modulate signaling uh, between cells and recognition between cells. You can imagine as two cells interact with each other, they have to deal with that carbohydrate coating. So that, that complex carbohydrate coating, those glycans that are at the cell surface, really modulate how cells function in the context of tissues. So we're going to really focus in in my little bit of a talk here on the cell surface glycans, but don't forget there's glycans everywhere in animal cells. So sort of the th big three things I want to get through today is to talk about why you should care about glycans, glycosylation, glycoconjugates, glycoscience, and glycoinformatics. Why, why listen to me? Why, why think about this? And then I'm going to give an example. There's many I could have pulled up, but I'm going to give an example of some type of one particular type of data that I think is very rich in terms of being able to unmask glycan functions from an informatics standpoint especially, and then talk a little bit about how we can build connections between glycoscience knowledge and other types of knowledge, uh, how we could do it, and what are some of the limitations at this point uh, in where we are. So first of all, why care about glycans? So here's a list of uh, sort of the highlights, some of the most important places where glycans play a role in biology. And many of you are familiar with the ABO blood groups. ABO blood groups are essential for life and for, for understanding uh, blood biology, for understanding transfusion biology, for understanding transplantation. Every one of these blood groups are molecularly defined by the carbohydrates that you find on the cell surface of erythrocytes, but also pretty much every cell, especially epithelial cells in your body. So the ABO blood group antigens are glycans. Uh, there are glycan binding proteins on, on a cell that can recognize glycans on another cell. And this is especially important in an inflammation. So inflammatory cells like neutrophils, eosinophils, macrophages have glycan binding proteins that bind glycans. And that regulates the activation, the survival, um, the targeting of those uh, inflammatory cells. So this has, this has very important implications for diseases like asthma, irritable bowel uh, disease, uh, uh, emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and all kinds of autoimmune diseases. Glycans are highly regulatory components of the inflammatory uh, response, as well as inf uh, immunity in general, driving production of antibodies uh, of particular uh, um, specificities. We know that cancer cells change the glycans on their surface as the disease progresses towards metastasis, and that changes in glycosylation have important consequences for how cancer cells leave a tumor and become metastatic, move through the blood supply, get out of the blood supply, and go to other tissues. Uh, so glycobiology of cancer is a very big area. Uh, but just in general, altered glycan expression um, causes or has been linked to or may provide a therapeutic target for a whole host of diseases, diabetes, congenital muscular dystrophies, lysosomal storage disorders like mucopolysaccharidoses, it's involved in neurodegeneration, various de developmental intellectual disabilities, sickle cell disease, coagulopathies, stroke, host pathogen interactions. It's been said by people that know more than I do that uh, carbohydrates and glycans are involved in almost every human disease in one way or another, especially when you get to stages where there's an inflammatory component to them. So this is just a list. It's kind of boring and dry. But I'd like to show you one of my sort of favorite examples 
of why I think glycans are extraordinarily interesting in, from a biological standpoint. And this has to do with normal tissue architecture, normal tissue development, especially in the brain. Okay, so this is a rat brain section that's been stained with three antibodies, three different antibodies that have specificity all for the same protein. So they're recognizing the same polypeptide, but they're recognizing that polypeptide that has different carbohydrates on it. So they're recognizing three different glycoforms of the same protein. So you can see that here in the brainstem, this particular protein has a brainstem specific glycosylation pattern, and that's the blue. So there's the blue glycoform of this protein. If you look in the cerebellum, there's a little bit more of this red form. If you look in the hippocampus, you can see there's really some spatial limitations for which glycoforms are found in which layer of the hippocampus. And if you look up here in the cortex, which is shown in higher magnification over here, you can see there's a laminar pattern of cells within the cortex, we know that. But the different lamini have different specificities for how they're glycosylating this protein. And even in, within one very important layer of the cortex, you can see that neighboring cells are glycosylating the protein differently, right? So that level of cellular specificity and how a protein is glycosylated is beyond right now our understanding of regulation of glycosylation, but it sort of poses some really important questions. Like, so what are the functions for this different glycosylation in different cells? Why do these cells have to glycosylate this protein differently at the level of tissue subdomains, but even at the level of, of neighboring cells? And also, so how does this finely regulated glycan expression kind of fit within our contextual framework of biology, of gene expression, how gene expression controls our biology? How does this level of, of regulation and of cellular specificity kind of fit into that? So I'll just take a second to remind you of the central dogma, right? Back in 1970, we understood that finally that DNA encodes RNA, RNA encodes proteins, right? So very simple uh, linear polymers, one driving the production of the next, driving the production of the next. And those proteins somehow come together, work together to regulate gene expression, or translation, also to regulate how cells function and how they work together to become an organism, right? It's a central dogma. But this really <coughs> completely ignores the roles for lipids and glycans, right? And how you put cells together is really a function of what's at the cell surface. So I think it's appropriate to propose sort of an extension of the central dogma, where prote many proteins are actually enzymes, right, that can form glycoconjugates, either pr proteins or lipids. So there are enzymes that build these glycoconjugates, and there are also protein backbones for many of these glycoconjugates. These are at the cell surface, and it's these molecules at the cell surface that mediate the interactions that lead to the production of an organism. So I think this is a better thought about how the world is put together. And I just um, uh, want to talk a little bit about where we are informatically in terms of talking about glycans. So this is a conception of a cell. So here's the cell membrane and the glycoproteins in the cell membrane so of different types. So here's a glycoprotein that has what we call N-linked glycans and O-linked glycans. That's glycans linked to asparagines or glycans linked to serines or threonines. And you see these little shapes with colors, circles and squares that have a key down here that tells us what each of the monosaccharides are that build those glycans. I'm showing you this because it's not my fantasy, but it's actually uh, uh, an accepted uh, nomenclature that's used broadly by glycobiologists. These shapes and colors have meaning. Um, that's shown down here. There won't be any test on this. But uh, if you look at these long enough, I can look at this structure and almost immediately understand how it was built and what its functions might be. So we have a harmonized way to represent glycans by the so-called symbol nomenclature for glycans, which has been built and accepted by the community. It hides some of the, some of the fine details of the structure, but it gives us a way to rapidly recognize what a structure is. And these structures can be encoded at more detail by descriptors that have been developed by the community that are machine usable, right? so not just visual cartoons, but, but strings that actually define the glycan structure. And we also have a very useful resource developed by Kyoko and others in the community um, that allows us to give each glycan structure a unique identifier um, that, uh, um, that users can deposit their glycan structures uh, in the glycan repository and get a number that can go into publications, which 
allows us to do a lot of different things. So we, are, we have some tools for informatics to, to try and build on, um, to, to, to link this knowledge to other domains. And, and again, we think this is really important because we know that glycoconjugates, whether they're secreted from cells or they're at the cell surface, uh, regulate really essential functions, both in health and disease. Um, just sort of an aside, almost all currently marketed biologics, whether they're antibodies for Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, or cancer, most all of those, all of those are glycoproteins. Uh, enzymes for enzyme replacement ther therapy have glycans on them that are important for their function. So there's an important pharmaceutical component to understanding glycobiology. We also know that the glycans that are on proteins can frequently regulate the function of those proteins. So they're not just presented on the proteins, but they actually modulate the activity of the proteins. So it'd be nice to be able to have a way, given the tools we have, to sort of put all this data somewhere. So is there a place where all this data is captured, both the functional components, but also the structural components, as well as the glycoconjugate nature, what glycans are on what proteins? And I mean, you think about this, the four major molecular domains of life, nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and I would say glycans are the fourth. For three of these, there are really well-developed, well-funded, strong, ongoing uh, databases uh, and knowledge bases to, to access knowledge in that area. So what about the glycans? What about the glycans that define what we call the glycome? So every cell has a glycome, every tissue has a glycome. Where are the, where's that data live? Um, where, what are the glycosylation databases? And there are some, some I would say not, no longer emerging, but becoming mature, um, um, building, expanding, and interacting databases. Glygen is one, Glycosmos in Japan, Glyconnect in Europe. Together form an alliance called the Glyspace Alliance, and it's very well represented here. Frederic's here, Kyoko's here, Glygen is represented here. So, so we're building these databases, and the question is, how do we connect this to other knowledge? All right, so uh, one way to do that, we hope, is through functions. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and just talk about one particular type of data. Um, as I said before, there's other types of data we could, we could talk about that I think are gonna be useful to link function. But I'm gonna talk about trying to understand the specificity of glycan binding proteins. So a glycan binding protein is simply a, a protein shown here in this blue shape that recognizes a glycan, binds to a glycan. And those are, these are important because they help to translate the glycome, right? So a particular cell, in this case, we're, we're annotating this as a cell that's in a tissue, as a self cell. It has certain glycans on it. Those glycans are interpreted by these glycan binding proteins, so another cell might know that that cell is self in the context of the immune system. There's other contexts we could talk about. So glycan binding proteins are able to detect glycans in other cells. Of course, pathogens are really smart. They've subverted the system in many cases. They make their own glycan binding proteins or they make their own glycans that look like the glycans of host. And there's this, within the immune system, there's this tension between pathogens and host that drives evolution in many cases. But glycan binding proteins and the specificity of those glycan binding proteins is not a trivial thing to pull together. There's I would say hundreds of glycan binding proteins encoded in our genome. And of course, there's uh, thousands of glycans that are made by, by cells in various tissues. So trying to match glycan binding proteins with the glycans has really been accelerated over the last 20 years, 30 years, by the development of glycan arrays and using those arrays to look for binding specificity. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. You immobilize glycans with known structures onto a, onto a support, and there's several different ways to do that, and it's important to understand that chemistry. And then you take a protein that you think might be a glycan binding protein, and you put a fluorescent tag on it, and you simply ask, can this glycan binding protein recognize any of these glycans? And the sort of informatic things here to know are that this protein probably has a uniprot ID. Each of these glycans have glycan IDs, so you can begin to formulate how these, you could put some of this information together with other resources, right? And then you can just look at the, at, the, at the array and find which glycan structures are actually binding to the glycan binding protein. 
So this is a hypothesis generator, right? It, likes, it allows you to, if you interpret and curate this array data, it allows you to sort of say, okay, this glycan binding protein recognizes these structural features or motifs on these glycans. Um, and you can begin to ask how the biosynthesis of that rate, uh, interacts with the binding activity and sort of tissue distributions and other sorts of uh, 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 questions. So let's think about sort of in the context of the immune system, you might have a circulating leukocyte that has this glycan binding protein that recognizes that glycan on a protein on, say, a vascular endothelial cell. That interaction leads to some signaling that changes the behavior of that leukocyte, right? So what are the sort of high value things from an informatic point of view that you'd like to know having defined this interaction? You might want to know where the glycan's expressed, what tissues, what cell types expressed the recognized glycan. You might want to know what the biosynthetic pathway is for the recognized portion of that glycan. You might want to know where the protein, both the binding protein and the protein that has that glycan on it, where are they expressed? Are there other proteins that also have that glycan on it? And what sites on that protein have that glycan? So there's a lot of data that's out there and available that you might pull together to enrich the model of what's happening in this biological context. So just to finish up here with a few thoughts about how to connect these knowledges with other bits of knowledge. So I told you that this binding protein recognizes some part of this glycan. We think about those recognized parts as motifs. So there's three different glycans. This glycan has a motif of terminal mannoses, these green circles, I know that's a mannose. This glycan has a silated LACNAC. I know that because of the shapes and the colors. This glycan has a Lewis X structure, which is a silo with a fucose. Right? So this glycan binding protein is recognizing this motif, this Lewis uh, X motif. Okay, so um, we've, uh, many people over the years have, have sort of understood and thought about these motifs and there are efforts to kind of bring these motifs together and curate them in ways that they're informatically accessible and can be annotated by the community. So I'm just showing you for Glygen's effort, a list of motifs we, sh we uh, Nathan Lewis, uh, Nathan Edwards has, has uh, uh, accumulated 120 defined motifs working with people in the field and the literature. And so here's the Lewis X motif without the silic acid. Further down the list, the solid Lewis X motif is there as well. You see the motifs have identifiers. There's information about the motifs and the number of glycans within the glygen resource that have these different motifs. So there's some ability here to link identifiers with what glycans have those motifs. And you might want to think about adding a couple more columns to this, for instance, like associated go terms, func gene ontology functional terms that might be associated with either the glycan or maybe with the protein under underlying the glycan that has a gene associated with it, and maybe associating disease or morbidities with these motifs. So there's room to move. We don't do this now. We would like to. There's room in this space to move into that kinds of information. So I'll just finish up with some my own personal thoughts about opportunities for detecting glycan functions by identifying connections between glycosylation data and other types of data, right? So I've mentioned already through gene expression, uh, specifically about biosynthetic enzymes. So we actually, it's, uh, it's, I'm a little ashamed to say that within the glycoscience field, we know a lot about the enzymes that make glycans. A lot of work has been done on enzyme specificities. We know some, about, a, a bit about where these enzymes are expressed. They tend to be expressed at very low levels and are not often seen in classic gene array experiments. So, so, so a little bit tricky to say that we really have good expression data, but people are working on that. We don't have a lot of instances where we, you can say, in this cell, this gene was turned on and now you make this glycan. It's not always that linear because sometimes there's redundancies in enzymes and sometimes the enzymes don't recognize exactly what we thought they recognized. So, so pulling together gene expression data, tissue specific, cell specific expression data with glycomics data on a larger scale, I think there's a lot to be learned about, uh, about uh, the, the glycoscience of, of glycan expression and glycobiology. Also, as I mentioned, through glycan binding protein specificities, understanding what 
binding proteins are expressed where, how they contribute to, to health, inflammation, uh, or disease, I think can really bring us a, a very much deeper understanding of a lot of disorders, especially immune and inflammatory disorders. And then one area I think is really exciting to explore is metabolomics. So glycan production, glycan synthesis, glycan modifications are very, very sensitive to the cellular environment. Oxygen levels in tissue culture, glucose levels in tissue culture dramatically affect what glycans are placed on the cell surface. So there's a, a, a really growing literature and growing effort in understanding the broader idea of how the metabolome of a cell affects the, gly the glycosylation of proteins. And so linking to metabolomic databases through nucleotide sugar levels or through some sort of intermediate, I think is gonna be really interesting to understand the, the sort of metabolome signature and how that correlates with glycan expression. I think there's plenty of other opportunities too that, that we can maybe come up with a little bit today. Of course, there's always some limitations to really, really gl uh, a growing uh, the, the links between glycan function and the glycoscience domain to others. And of course, we know a lot of these. One of them, especially for us, I think, personnel, there's not a lot of the, the pool of basic science researchers that have some familiarity with glycobiology is not huge. And within that pool, the number that have an appreciation of how bioinformatics can help them is even smaller. So we need to grow that um, and let our students know about the importance of some of these concepts. Language is a limitation. We do have some harmonized ways to talk to each other, especially within uh, the collaborators that are here in the Glyspace Alliance and their, and their collaborators. But there's still a lot of people that want to call their glycans what they want to call them, and that don't quite line up with what would work from an informatic uh, standpoint. There's some social limitations. It would be nice if our, some of our journal editorial boards would push some pressure on, you, on, on authors to sort of use the harmonized ways to express glycans. That would be a a big boost, but that's been slow, slow to come. It's getting better, but it's been slow. Uh, I haven't really talked about this too much, but you probably can imagine from the sh images I showed you that glycans are, compared to RNA and DNA, they're a bit more complex structurally. They're branched, and they, they have positional isomers that need to be represented. So there's sort of an inherent complexity in representing these glycans. A lot of that has been overcome, but there's still, uh, especially at the analytic level, um, there's different levels of resolution that people achieve in terms of defining their glycan structures depending on what techniques they use. So there has to be a way to represent ambiguity within these structures in a way that you really don't have to do with a polypeptide or, or nucleic acid sequence. Also, just thinking about how we connect with other sort of functional domains uh, uh, informatically, um, maybe sometimes we don't care as much about some things as other domains do and until we talk more to each other. What are the what are the, the terms, what are the uh, uh, concepts that we want to together prioritize to try and link together? And of course, funding, funding, funding to maintain consistency of personnel and effort is always a limitation. And so that's where I'll stop. I'm just trying to give you a, a, a quick blow through why glycans are important, how we can connect functions, and how we can get there in sort of high-impact high ways. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to try and address them. Thank you. So we want to, are there questions? If not, we can. OK. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I already mentioned that we okay. had four questions, okay. and the questions are also here. OK, so. good. So, so yesterday, we have a wonderful meeting. Um, on discussing things related to glycogen, Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, sorry. I'm Cecilia Rigi. <laughs> I work uh, um, at Uniprod, um, and from the Uniprod is on different, three different sites. I'm from in the US part. And uh, yesterday we have uh, discussions and different questions, and I am the reporter for question one with Rene. Uh, and the question one was about how would your resource extract like and extracted uh, related data from the literature or other resources? So this was the group that uh, sit down together to put this presentation. 
uh, Hiren Yoshi was the, the chair of the session. There were three groups, three different resources that described their work on uh, the glycan-related curation. Uh, Yuki Akuni for glycosciences, Christian Axelsen from RIA, um, and James Irvine for sugar-based resource. And then three members that we participated in the discussion as well. Rene, myself, and Vijay Shankar from University of Delaware. Okay, so the first thing is each group described their curation workflow very briefly. And we find a different, these are very different workflows because the topic of curations are different. Uh, RIA uh, curates reactions, enzymatic reactions, and they uh, start by finding um, papers that haven't been annotated yet. They try to identify all the different uh, components of that reaction and, and map them to KEBI terms. If they are not there, they actually they provide the terms to KEBI, they contribute. Uh, they later create the reaction, um, add the relevant cross-references, and then two curators. Is the curations are double-checked. In the case of sugar base, now this is what happened. <laughs> okay, so somehow there was this glycointeractome goes here, and this sugar base goes here. There some must be something with the present with the presentation here. So in the case of glycointeractome. Uh, the, this is a very different uh, workflow because it's about uh, capturing information from uh, glycan microarrays. Um, and they uh, define the criteria to select the publications. Uh, they have a system, set up a system to, uh, that is uh, rule-based to capture, uh, to identify the different, um, uh, the different keywords. And they are working with someone at the uh, Imperial College of London who has the system already working for metabolomics and they are kind of modifying that for this purpose. Uh, they do manual curation though for uh, providing the conclusions on each glycan uh, binding uh, samples and probes from individual papers. Then they assemble all the papers together, um, the results, and establish an expert committee to do the final um, conclusions. And in the case of sugar base, uh, they do um, curation of uh, the glycan sequence structures and they start with again with papers that haven't been annotated and they manually have to transcribe the glycan structure into the IUPAC condensed format. Uh, they also add uh, additional information like species and um, tissue, they use Uberon and disease ontology for diseases and then a reference ID and then they check uh, programmatically if the structure of the glycan is correct. Um, the, and there's one curator doing that. They are different workflows, but they, we identified similar problems in terms of uh, looking into the information in the papers. Uh, currently, um, re reporting papers are incomplete. And I'm sure this will resonate with many of you working on curation. I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but, but you can chime in later on. Uh, there's critical information missing, experimental methods that affect the results are also missing. Uh, there are errors in the glycan data, uh, the statements, for example, of alpha and beta uh, linkages are all over the place. Um, no use of standards identifiers for glycans, although there are at least three places where you can, three different uh, vocabularies that you can link to. These are not um, used uh, frequently. And uh, journals, specifically, are not enforcing uh, the glycan standards. There is a Mirage, um, uh, there is a guideline called Mirage for annotating uh, glycans, reporting glycans, but journals, some journals require, uh, recommend, but they do not require you to follow the guideline. Uh, so that's not enforced, so that's a problem. Here is an example for <laughs> Um, sugar base where provided by uh, uh, sugar base where there are basically two images that are not computable at this time you can ha they have to take look at the image and manually translate this into the glycan structure so that's not a good thing to do so I'm gonna pass to you thank you I'm Renny Ranzinger, I'm part of the Glycan project. I will take over the second part of the talk and just continue with the problems that Cecilia started with. So 
in addition to uh, you know that you find clients very often in images, although they are text, and then you have to extract them by hand, you also find a lot of other um, nomenclatures in the literature that are used. There are common names like GM Freed and some kind of sequence formats, UPAC like formats, and of course the different images. And Mike was already talking about the cartoons, but they are also chemical drawing. So if you're a curator, you have to deal with all that stuff. And that requires quite some knowledge to actually see that and then put that into some chemical structure that you, know, you can work with. Um, the good thing is, like Mike already mentioned in the beginning, there is this SNFG, the symbol nomenclature for glycans, which is kind of this community agreed standard. And slowly but continuously, we are moving into that direction. Um, you can go to the web page or you can just uh, Google for it. They essentially have very uh, strict definitions how you should be representing your clients in your uh, in your paper if you are using picture representations, and people use it. Although you know sometimes you find somebody that wants to use their own shapes, their own symbols, their own colors, but that goes down. So that helps in the curation because if we get people to use that standard, you at least have to deal with one symbol format rather than tons of them. Uh, the other thing that helps uh, with these problems that we mentioned before, missing information or uh, you know, incomplete descriptions, is the Mirage guidelines. So Mirage means minimum information required for glycomics experiment. That's a, a consortium that started like 12 years ago. And the aim was here to uh, define reporting guidelines. So if you do a certain type of, uh, of experiment, what do you have to put in your paper to make your experiment reproducible and understandable? So uh, this group meets every year, and then we work over the year. And they have a bunch of guidelines already predefined uh, that are available and published. Uh, for sample, glycan sample preparation, mass spec, uh, glycan arrays, NMR, and so on. And the guidelines don't tell people how we have to do the experiments. We do the experiments however we want, but we tell them, okay, this is the pieces of information you have to put in your paper to actually help people. And that obviously helps curators as well, because hopefully then the papers are complete and you don't have missing pieces of information. Uh, there are also guidelines that are in preparation, the Lectin micro -ary guidelines, and it's an active group. So if you're working on glycomics and you think, hey, we need guidelines for that type of glycomics experiment, just get in contact with us. You can also talk with me, and we will see what we can do. Again, these guidelines help to essentially make papers more complete and hopefully help curators as well. And then, out of the discussion yesterday, we also figured out, okay, we don't just have problems, but we also have some solutions. So there are some tools that can help with, uh, you know, curating uh, glycan information. So there are validation tools that essentially, once you put the glycans into sequences, and then you can run these validation tools to check if your sequences are correct or at least sound. Uh, there are tools to help with uh, PDB, uh, the structure confirmation if the glycans are okay. There is image extraction, I will talk about that in a second. And there is the Glyc Consortium, that's the Glycoinformatics Consortium. Uh, we have a web page with tons of tools that you can look at and see if there's something that can help you. And then we have the uh, you know, standard curation tools uh, that people are using like PubTator for annotating uh, information on, in the papers, and then also like lit uh, suggest that can help you find papers that might be of interest for you. So one thing that we think is really helpful for curators is we already talked about the cartoons, right? But there are images, and very often there are images that are not working. Um, that are within the images, right? Here is a mass spec, and then you have on this little uh, uh, MC values, you have the little cartoons. Now, if you want to extract them by hand, that image alone keeps you busy for half an hour, okay? Um, 
We have a tool on, um, Nathan Edwards was working on that. He's part of the Gliding Group. You can find that online. It's free to use. And what you can do is you can upload an image or you can upload a, a, a paper, a PDF, and it will find uh, the, the Glycan cartoons for you. And then when you click on these yellow symbols, it extracts that Glycan cartoon and gets you the sequence. So instead of you doing that by hand, it can help you to do that automatically. And then you can use it a second tool called GNOME, where you essentially then can look for uh, glycan structures that are related to that glycan. So very often you have, uh, 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 what the tool doesn't do is doesn't extract sequence information. So sometimes you have this little you know, alpha one, two and so on in there, but it helps you to find the basic structure and then you can navigate to the structure that you are actually looking for. And then you have the glycan two can IDs here and you have an identifier for that like, and so it really helps you finding the identifier there. Um, okay, we have a bunch of posters for the people that were part of that group, and if you are interested, just you know, come to the poster, talk to us, and we are happy to talk with you or help you um, with anything. So that's the summary of this first question. Um, what do we do to curate like in structures. Um, yes. Thank you. Maybe I can ask if there are others who do something different. Okay. So, are there any, any other experiences, or are you working on curation? You have problems, questions you want to bring up now? We also have a bigger uh, uh, um, question or open discussion session in the end, but anything that comes to mind? Yes, then. I, uh, thank you, Rene, for your coverage. I should know, but does your glycan extractor include or beginning to include O glycans, where I know there's a lot of complexity to consider? Yes, so that. The example was for n glycans, but o glycan are supported as well. Glycolipids also work. So feel free to test that tool out. Again, if you didn't type the link down, you can also you know, get in contact with me. I can send it to you. Other questions? OK, then I would say we go to the second group um, and get their summary for the second question. I guess we are missing a reporter right now. Um, I would say let's jump to question three first and hope that he shows up. Okay, just as we wait for the slides, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Callum Ives. I'm a postdoc in the FADA group where we're developing a database called Glycoshape. Um, it's coming. <laughs> Perfect, so I'm the reporter for group three, where this is the question we are focusing on, what type of data that you do have might enhance glycan-related data. So the first thing that we felt that was important was to think of your target audience when having something like this. So the primary aim of a resource is to provide a service or information or data that would be beneficial to the research community. In fact, we want people to be able to use these resources. And so to that effect, it's important to take into account the type and the format of this glycan-related data so that we can tailor it to these audiences. So we need it to be accessible to glycobiologists. Obviously, they're interested in glycans. It's their main area of focus. But we also want to open this up so non-glycobiologists can use this. So for example, some of the people that were represented in our workshop yesterday, we had immunologists, biochemists, structural biologists, chemists, medicinal chemists, biophysics, biophysicists, sorry, et cetera, and so on. And there's lots of different types of glycan-related data that can be available in these resources. So we've got just a very broad overview here, and we'll go through each of these in a bit more detail in the following slides. But we have things like gene ontology, so molecular function, cellular process, subcellular location. We have things like glycan structures. So we had those in the previous two talks, but this idea of 2D structures and 3D structures. 
We have glycoconjugates. These are glycans which are attached to other biological macromolecules. So for example, glycolipids and glycoproteins with glycans attached to lipids and proteins respectively. And then we had this idea of glycan interactions. So whether that be glycan-glycan interactions or glycan-protein interactions. And through integrating and combining all of these together, it gives us a more complete biological overview of these processes. So looking at the first of these, we have glycan-related ontologies, and we can see a broad number of examples here. And it's worth mentioning at this point that with all these tools that we're saying here, the vast majority of people that make and develop these tools are within this room. So any interest in any of these, they're the people to find. But we can see, for example, just going through these very briefly, we have glyco-RDF for glycan structures, publications, biological sources and citations. glyco -O, so it's an expansion of glyco-RDF. We have GNOME for glycan structures. Um, Glystream for, uh, Glystream, sorry, for glycan structures and in particular substructure search. Um, GGD onto for glycogen disease ontologies, glycan bind, and glycans onto. So like we said here, there's a, a large number of these. So I'm just gonna go through one of them as an exemplar, exemplar just so I can give you a better idea of these. So we have glycans onto, which provides information on glycosylation pathways, um, which describes the process involved in synthesizing a particular glycan. So we can see that shown here on um, the figure on the right-hand side. So we have things like the glycan substrate biosynthesis and the transport of that substrate. We have things like the um, biosynthesis of that glycan and the degradation, and then the modification of particular monosaccharides of that glycan. And these pathways are def um, defined by what parts of the glycan structure they create. And speaking about glycan structure, that brings us on to um, thinking about the structure of a glycan and how that structure um, is intrinsically linked to the function of a glycan. So therefore, it's important to look at the two-dimensional structure. So we have, for example, this SNFG cartoons that we've heard about previously. So this is the idea of the constituent monosaccharides that form a glycan and the linkages between these. So we have resources such as Glytucan, Glycowork or Sugarbase, and Kebi, which would give us information on this. And then because of the intrinsic flexibility of a glycan, it's particularly difficult to look at their 3D structure using classical structural um, biology techniques, so things like X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, so, et cetera. So for that, to that end, we have resources like Glycoshape, um, which are determine the structures of glycans from equilibrium molecular dynamic simulations. It's worth mentioning this last one's coming soon. It's not quite ready yet. We also have resources for glycoconjugates. So like we said before, these are glycans that are attached to biological macromolecules. So for glycoproteins, we have databases which are within the Glyspace Alliance that we heard of previously. So Glygen, Glycosmos, and Glycoexpacy. And we also have various repositories, so things like Glycome and Glycodomain Viewer. And similarly, there's um, resources that are available for glycolipids, for example, Swiss lipids, lipid maps, and Glycosmos. There's also important, like we said, in glycan function is this idea of glycan interactions, whether that be glycan-glycan, glycan-protein. And there's some example of resources we have for that here. So we have Intact, um, which provides, so Matrix DB is an active contributor to this, is providing uh, information on glycosamine glycans, or GAGs, and their interaction data. And there's plans in place to connect this to glycan microarray, microarray data, sorry. We also have Reactome, so this is, um, has many glycan-related information and is available via the glycosmos pathway. And then we have things like unilectins, which have information on lectins and PDB structures and glycan binding proteins. Now we've mentioned all of these resources and it's worth mentioning at this point that there is an inherent bias in this. And we can see that by the size of these animals and this is we have more data for things like N and O glycans than we do compared to glycan arrays. And then if we compare that to, I don't know how well people can see it, on the right-hand side, we have these little ants, so things like exopolysaccharides and lipopolysaccharides. And that's, if we have more data for something, we're able then to make more resources for something. So it's worth mentioning that in all of these, there is an inherent bias towards NNO-glycans just because we have more data of them. And the last bit I want to do about is bring it back to this idea that we had at the end of um, one of the earlier slides about this idea of integrating glycan data to provide a more complete biological picture. And it's worth mentioning that all of these resources that we said are people generating new data and put it on a resource. But there's actually a lot of hidden data that's already available. And that's because we have, particularly in omics data resources, whether that be uh, metabolomics, lipidomics, data that's present, but it hasn't been annotated with glycan identifiers. So therefore, it's already there. We've already got it, but it's under the radar. 
So text annotation tools that can support glycan identification can help, um, help make these effectively more visible and add them to current resources. So to that end, we have pub annotation, for example, which has been used in Glycosmos to assist in curation. And similarly, we also have glycan array repositories and databases, which are useful to describe glycan recognition and binding patterns. Yeah, that was all from our group. So, thank you. So I'm going to do question number two. Uh, the reporter was Nathan, but he couldn't come today. So I'm going to go over their slides. So the question was, what type of glycan-related data would be useful to your resource that you don't have access to, or currently have access to? So from IEDB, um, the connection between structures with epitopes, the various species the epitopes are observed in, structures epitopes are observed in, similarity between epitope and structures, how to link effectively to glycan resources, CABI, glycoepitope, glycomotif, and, and of course uh, the SNFG cartoons that Mike was, uh, was showing. So all of this uh, would help uh, present the glycan information in IEDB better. Um, for Go, uh, Paul showed us, uh, actually the first one, you know, Randy uh, provided us that information. Randy Vita, I don't know if you're here. Um, gene ontology, um, lots of stuff already there. We saw uh, several nodes, which has a lot of information. Um, it would be great if Go captures functions of proteins um, and then connects them also to the information that uh, can connect them to glycosyl transferases and other items which all end up relating to the glycan structures. Um, one thing to consider is community effort to revise the ontology uh, or review and revise the ontology if needed and add protein annotations in glycobiology. Uh, how to conceptualize model glycan function. Um, are they molecular machines or, mole or are they important for molecular recognition or modulate the protein function? I mean, these are things that uh, was mentioned yesterday during our workshop things to consider and um, see where this leads to. So glycan interactome knowledge base uh, increase, uh, they would like to increase adoption of Mirage guidelines for array data and see adoption of Mirage guidelines uh, by the authors, uh, careful curation of existing glycan array data and metadata, connection with existing interaction resources, um, see how that can be done, need for microenvironment specific glycan ligand expression and glycan binding keyword in protein databases. So uh, as far as we know, in protein databases such as um, Uniprot or, or other resources, that keyword may not be there or the way to connect it may not be there, although it could be, um, from what I understood yesterday, gene ontology terms could be used to connect it already. So, so um, that's something that came up yesterday. So glycan abundance in various contexts, species, tissues, cell type, and so on. Also in an experimental study or study concept, there are a lot of uh, single cell uh, talks from what I was seeing in the workshop uh, or in the, in the biocreation meeting conference. Um, maybe we will hear some about, of, of that later on. Uh, use of evidence code um, for experimental glycan observation. Uh, is that something that uh, the glycoinformatics resources should start using or, or consider using? Um, glycan binding proteins often need additional context, density clusters, others. How to capture this? What experiments? Metadata is, in, is needed to think about this. Um, and that was question two. Start four, okay. All right, so, <laughs> okay. So, so we copied, copied question once, a great idea to have a picture, but we were a little bit late, so we took this after we saw question one's response. Uh, so I want to cite that, at least verbally, that it was an idea that came from question one participants. So what standards um, your resource use uh, for glycan-related annotations. And to tell you the truth, um, we didn't have time to make a 
make a list that was uh, comprehensive. But I think this is a start. And, and I think question for the way we envision it is that this list can at least get us talking the same language amongst different bio-curators as we are working, including text mining, including curation, and so on. So if you look at it, if you are trying to refer to a glycan structure, so Kebi, of course, you know, they have their identifiers and they have their um, um, ways of referring to the structures. Um, so Kebi intact, um, but also um, it's not exactly, you know, some of them they are cross-referencing to different resources. So either you are using a particular format or you are cross-referencing. I mean, they're not exactly equal, but at least if you have the cross-references, you can still try to traverse that space. Um, and the more comprehensive this list is, um, the better it is. Now, is it even possible for all of the different groups represented even here to converge to a particular representation? We don't know, and that's what maybe some of the questions uh, or the discussion should be today after the fourth question. So is the, what do people think of converging towards a common representation? But to even do a common representation, of course, you know, there's a cost to it, right? There's a software uh, cost. Is if, if the software that is used, is it open source? And, and if it is, uh, or where it is available, how often it is updated? And all of these questions has to uh, come into play. Um, Disease, uh, again, we didn't have enough time, but at least these are the ones that was mentioned. Um, so uh, in Kebi right now, uh, they don't connect to any diseases. Um, in Glygen, we are primarily using disease ontology, and we rely on DO group to connect to the other ontologies. Intact um, are planning on using Mondo um, and or HPO. Um, uh, MGI has DO, but there was no, I mean, in the workshop, uh, I, I don't, yeah, there was nobody from MGI, but at least that's what I at least we know. Uniprot KB um, uh, annotates or uh, has, connects to or uses MIM and, and Orphanet, but they do also have cross-references to other terms, you know. Um, PubChem uses Mesh ID and DO. So again, um, we felt that you know, having this type of information when it's connected to the glycans it can be important. So right now, is there a plan that you can do it like Sorry? Yeah, so, 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 so our hope or, yeah, so when I put this up, I mean, actually that's the exact reason I, we put it up is that there are things that are already there now, which might not be here, then there are things which are planned, which is going to happen in the near future, or maybe even within a year or two, whatever it is, and that needs to be also captured because uh, people need to know what the plans are. The community needs to know. So if Uniprot is going to use something, if another resource says, oh, Uniprot is going to use it, maybe I should also start using it, that's always a good way because uh, by the time Uniprot uses if somebody already has started using something else, then moving is much, much harder. So as a community, I think mm, it will be great if we can um, openly make this type of information available of what we are planning on doing. So the white paper that I was talking about, or a publication um, that I was talking about, hopefully we will have a, I'm just, I haven't had input yet, we will have a table which is more complete of what is there and what will be planned. Uh, and that table could be a starting point for that type of um, discussion. Um, where the table can reside, you know, that's again open to the community um, uh, to discuss. So, uh, Mike is going to present a summary of our discussions. I don't have enough hands. <laughs> So yeah, so the fourth, the fourth working group, <clears throat> excuse me.
just sort of summarize some of the discussion that we had after we tried to build those tables, sort of based first on opportunities and then again on, on limitations. Um, also, some useful tools that we've kind of identified as we were talking, but things that we really would like to see happen is to sort of develop a strategy for creating glycan-centric go terms using domain experts and to get them in a room and make them th forget anything they know about go terms and just come up with what are the go terms that would be associated with glycans and then do the interesting comparison to see how that aligns with existing go terms. Uh, need a better understanding of how existing resources that were there can best serve the needs of other resources. How do we talk to each other? Gen maybe generate some sort of a clearinghouse that this paper could be the first step towards that describes the best places to go for specific needs. Um, we need to prepare, perhaps need to prepare sort of a subset of cartoons or structures that people that don't know a lot about glycans can go to to say this is a good starting point. It may not have all the structural possibilities, but these are the most likely biologically relevant, biosynthetically possible uh, structures to use as a starting point. And Lipid Maps does this in terms of forgetting about some of the heterogeneity in their structures, and that might be a good model. Um, in general, it's important to have identifiers that point to structures that say not only what a user knows, but what a user doesn't know about that structure. So um, ambiguity is important to, to acknowledge. Um, some tools that are useful, GNOME provides identifiers for glycans at all levels of ambiguity um, and already connects with some resources. So GNOME, we've heard about GNOME before. Tugo ID translates across ID spaces in multiple data domains, not just in, in glycosciences. So those are some opportunities and tools we talked about. Some challenges we talked about, and you've heard also from other of the groups. Um, data frequently contains only partially defined glycan structures, and that means that there's not a KEBI identifier associated with that glycan structure. So that's a bit of a challenge in some relations. Um, description of synthetic pathways requires these fully explicitly defined glycan structures, so that can be a stumbling point. Um, a, a challenge, finding domain experts to help with curation. Always hard to bring people in if there's not a, an, an acknowledged benefit that they can see to help, to help out with the curation. Uh, richness of phenotype and disease terms that are relevant to diseases of glycosylation or to mutants, mouse mutants that may be lacking glycogenes. The richness of those descriptors is kind of sparse at the moment. It could be expanded. And so that means also that ma mapping mouse mutant data to human congenital disorders of glycosylation or CDG phenotypes is not always very easy. Um, and of course, identifying these sorts of gaps in knowledge really requires these sort of collaborative um, get-togethers and discussions. Um, uh, connecting curated papers that report partially defined structures to resources that cannot map to such data. We talked about RIA, that's a, a challenge as well. Again, dealing with the ambiguity that we get experimentally in glycan structures. So I think that was, yeah, the end of question four's discussion. I think we can open up to the open question, comments, thoughts. Yeah, I'm not an expert in this area at all, but um, when we were annotating the uh, glycan-related enzymes in Flybase, we used a database called KZ. Um, I haven't heard that mentioned today. I just wondered whether that's still a database used by you guys or whether it's deemed to be retired in some way. Yeah, no, by no means retired. Growing and very active. It has a kind of a slightly different purpose, though, than I think thinking about biosynthetic pathways and functional glycomics, if you will. It does a really good job of representing and thinking about evolutionary structures between enzymes and grouping them by fam structural families. Um, and in some cases, those, those correlations also go along with specificities and, and enzyme activities, but not always. So, uh, so yeah, KZ is very active and very important to us, but it, it, different groups will use that information in different ways. Certainly, it, be it could be, yeah. I don't, uh, for, I 
think the KC has a lot of microbial data and plants. Yeah, and um, we've been only mainly focused on mammalian systems at this <laughs> and, and our workshop. But yeah, it's definitely part of the ecosystem. Um, this uh, is a good moment I, I had on my list of things to bring up. The microbiome. I know we've been more mammalian focused in these discussions, haven't you? But this enormous interaction, the microbiome host interaction, of course I don't need to remind people the size of our own microbiome, which outnumbers our cells. But here, and Kazi has just been brought up. So there are interactions between the microbiome and the host cell surfaces in, in the kind of terms we've been talking about. There is also the use by the microbiome of the components of the host epithelia in a manner which is extremely interactive, and these CASI enzymes, CASI groups of enzyme come to play, where they are able to uh, metabolize or break down these diverse categories of glycans for their own use, actually, a lot of the time, and of course, also the production of materials through these interactions which can affect as distant sites as the brain, right? Thanks, Dan. And um, there are efforts to catalog bacterial glycans as well. That space is huge, um, but Kyoko has an effort ongoing to do that. You want to uh, I just wanted to say that I'm going to pass this around so there will be at least three meetings in the next three months to try to put together um, this document that we are talking about. If you want to participate in that in those calls, uh, we will try to do something also asynchronous meeting, but we haven't figured out yet exactly how that's going to work um, because the time differences are just too, too much. I mean, we, we can't have a meeting which will work for everybody. So with that, I'm going to, if you want to participate in, in that meeting, please put your name and email address in here. We won't share your email address with anybody other than this group. Um, so uh, talking about uh, KZ, we had a talk um, from KZpedia, which from my understanding is uh, something in addition to what's going on. So there are articles in KZpedia that are being written for specific enzymes. Uh, which is also another um, interaction that we are we are looking into that we can we can have, and that's a community-driven um, wiki-based system that people are contributing to. This morning I was at the Wikidata uh, workshop. I mean, there there are a lot yeah there are lots of places that we can find out not to replicate what is already being done, but to leverage. I think that is the main thing. So there were lots of people in the workshop yesterday. Does, do any of you want to say something about of your thoughts from the workshop? Because we just kind of show, yeah. Yeah, I guess just from like an outsider perspective, um, my name's Emily, and I'm a postdoc from UBC, and I'm here representing the AMR crowd because um, I work with a class of natural products, immunoglycosides, so these are sugar-based compounds. Um, and a lot of the enzymes that work on inactivating these antibiotics are related to those that are involved, um, very important stages of glycan biosynthesis. And so it was really amazing to kind of be a part of the workshop yesterday to get to expand my knowledge base and what resources are out there to better um, understand these sugars and their importance for different uh, interactions, think of the chemistries in a different way, and then also share um, some of the knowledge that I can provide to the space as well. Um, so anyone in the prokaryotic space, be happy to meet and chat. Anyone else has any comments? You have any comments or suggestions on how we can proceed? Uh, hi, it was uh, interesting to see the, the disease mapping issues uh, for the, related to 
related to the glycosylation and the enzyme machinery. The problem with, with Uniprot has at the moment is that they're, they're heavily biased towards rare diseases via OMIM and um, Orphanet. So I don't know whether that has been thought about as a way to get to more common diseases which aren't very well indexed. Um, they're all in GWAS, but heaven forbid you should try and make sense of it from that end. Maria, <laughs> you're you. Oh, uh, you want to? Okay. So yeah, Uniprot is like, as you say, biased towards uh, monogenic diseases, and I think that bias will continue because we map to resources like MIM. We will introduce other vocabularies like Mondo, uh, and through that we'll get other ontologies as well, like disease ontology but we don't intend to become curators of complex diseases and mapping Uniprot records to complex disease descriptions. I think that's for another resource uh, of NIH to be doing. Um, while I've got the mic, actually, I do have a question. So glycans are one kind of small molecule and cells are full of different other kinds of small molecule as well, including lipids that we heard about. Um, and the standards that people use for all those other kinds of small molecules are different, so people tend to use sm things like smiles and inches and inchy keys to describe them. So I was wondering, do you have uh, converters for these uh, glycan-specific former mats like SNFG and IUPAC Condense that can generate smiles? Because that's really what's key to linking to resources like Uniprot, because Uniprot is not going to start using SNFG as a primary vocabulary. But if you could map everything in your glycan resources to smiles and then put it in Kebi, we could then map that onto Uniprot. Um, so I, we, we have glycan 2 uh, which is the works format. And we have a converter. We work with PubChem, actually. So we have converters from mole to works and works to mole. mole and then they can generate the smiles and inchy keys and all of that um, for us. So we can share that. Sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, obviously for, for smiles, if you go through Kebby and through Kebby out, out to PubChem, you, you do have the smiles mapping. But there's an interesting issue with the, with the, uh, with the, with the problem of the attachment points, because most of them are attached to something. So you've got a loose end. So I don't know how that's being addressed, on the, on the, for example, on the smiles coding side. I'm guessing a lot of these glycans, they don't exist in isolation. Well, you can en enzymatically cleave them off so they're, they're a unique molecular string, but in many cases, they're actually linked in. For example, with the Viva, they're linked. Yes, so very often we are actually not, the entire glycoconjugate is not represented as a smile string, but you have something, here's your protein, you have your FASTA sequence, and then you have your glycan, which is a different representation, and then you have the position where on that protein that glycan is attached. Uh, so for things like attachment points, we can deal with that in Uniprot because we started to map all the post-translational modifications. So we have a vocabulary of 400 and something distinct post-translational modifications, and we map them all to Kebi. So now there's a mapping between any site, which is modified in Uniprot and the Kebi ontology. So if you have a smiles representation with, with a, an attachment point, like an R group or something, this, is, this would link to a specific site in Uniprot and you would have the same glycan with an attachment point in a rear reaction, so you would be able to link any particular site in Uniprot to its glycan, and any site to all the possible reactions which could have created that site, and that rear uh, ID would be using enzyme annotation in Uniprot, so then you could also get to the enzyme. So for any site, you get the structure, you get linked to react every possible reaction, and for every possible reaction, all possible enzymes, and hopefully Uniprot will have the enzyme actually, the specific enzyme actually annotated, but if not, you would get all the possibilities that way. 
Well, just last thing as well, if you have atomic representations for glycan, you can do other things like uh, flux, uh, fluxomics, flux analysis. So the people who want to kind of follow atoms through genome scale metabolic models uh, for predicting results of tracer experiments, for instance. And if you put glycans in that space, you'll be able to do that as well. So you'll be able to, for instance, track a carbon, you know, throughout a genome scale metabolic model. Just a quick uh, small addition. There's also, I think, quite recently been a publication of a tool called Gliles, which is a uh, IUPAC to uh, smiles or smiles. Um, so yeah, just you, sounds like you already knew about that, but yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say there, there's a bit of a legacy in Uniprot of FT carbohydrates carbohydrate lines, where at some point there was a little bit of funding to map these kind of things. But just because you're a big project doesn't mean that you actually have funding to continue this kind of work. So uh, just pushing everything to Uniprot might mean that something happens, but then no funding, it doesn't really keep on happening. So, so yeah, so, so this conference is actually a great place to try to understand is that can we um, divide and conquer kind of a thing, like we can do certain things um, which can feed into other resources. Of course, we have to explain to the other resources, you know, before they can take in stuff. <laughs> um, so uh, trying to figure out how to do that and what is the high priority in which resource because yes, we can, uh, our group can help, for example, to update some of that material, but then is there the bandwidth in, in Uniprot, for example, or the interest in Uniprot to get that updated? So, so, th so those are the kind of things that we hope that this uh, conference will help us at least start discussing. Yeah. Sorry. Um, just, so just say one last thing. Like within Uniprot, we're using Kebi now for all small molecule annotation, and we'll probably only ever use one vocabulary for that because that makes it simple. But if if the glyco community can, for instance, seed Kebi uh, with things like uh, SNFG representations or works representations, other representations that are useful for people in glycobiology, we would then take them from Kebi. Yeah, and then you'd be able to do things with Uniprot that you just can't do now. So to give one example, like a few years ago, we used uh, text representations for small molecules, and then we switched to using Kebi. So we re-annotated everything with Kebi and replaced all the legacy data. So we did this for reactions, and we did it for small molecule ligands with specific binding sites. So now you can do things like um, substructure searches in Uniprot using SMILES, or uh, structure similarity searches even with things like our sparkle endpoint. And obviously when we had text labels for chemical structures, all of this was impossible. And you can also do other things like um, you know, group similar ligands, do structure comparisons with PDB, all of these kind of things. Uh, you know, we've done analyses of things like natural product likeness scores, uh, so the space of chemical structures in Uniprot versus PDB is actually very different and there's very little overlap. So if, I think if one, one route might be if the glycobiology community can uh, improve the representation of glyco standards in Kebi and the conversion and mapping of glyco standards to what I would call cheminformatic standards, then we can have both in Uniprot. And another resource we're working on in the group is the one that Christian was representing yesterday, which is RIA. And uh, glyco reactions in RIA are extremely difficult to understand because they're represented as kind of smiles and mole files. They're almost impossible for a human to read, while well, they are impossible for a human to read. But if we had SNFGs for those, then that would make the whole thing very, very simple and very nice to look at. And I think that's something that's really missing, is the connection between the, the, the chem inf what I would call cheminformatic standards and glycoinformatic standards. So we did publish a paper uh, last year or the year before that on data flow between Glygen, Kebi, and PubChem. And Adnan from Kebi is here, so we worked with Adnan and before the previous uh, curator in Kebi. And uh, the challenge still is when you have only composition, only undefined, uh, not fully defined structures, um, but we still submit those to Kebi. But then there's a Kebi ontology that we hope 
to have discussions which needs to have maybe some updates um, for carbohydrates to again sync with the glyco community. On top of that, there is thing going on in Glyconnect and, and Glycosmos, uh, which also is My point was not to say what's happening in Glyconnect. My point is maybe to just go back to the bottom line, the data. The data, we, we seem to be talking about a dream world where the structures are well defined and we know how monosaccharides are uh, linked with precision to, uh, to one another. The reality is that we have, so the, the, there's a 1,000 something or maybe 2,000 fully described structures in Kebi. And then we, at the level of curation, end up with, yes, as uh, Raja said, composition, ambiguous uh, structures, undefined linkages, and so on and so forth. So that, in fact, if we, we were talking about the, 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 the search space of glycans at the moment, yesterday in, in our group. And so we are probably facing millions of structures. At the moment, we have a few thousands well-defined. So if we really want, and this is why I forced my, my slide on bias on data, uh, uh, because there is bias. We keep on looking under the light of the lamppost and the information's out there in the dark. And so smiles is great. I mean, there's plenty of things that are great, but we, the, the amount that we don't know is massive. If you want to do a substructure search with half of the, mo uh, the, of the monosaccharides that are undefined, what are you substructuring the search for? Uh, what are you looking for? And so all of these questions are day-to-day are -day reality, and it's not that we can't do anything, we can, but let's not only focus on what is well-defined. It's not representative of all we have to explain. That was only my point. Rene. Um, following um, Frederic's point, and I had on my list columns, beautiful figure, which we didn't see yesterday, but you brought it out remarkably. The big elephant, N and O. The O I want to talk about briefly. And then the little horse is the, what was it, what was it labeled? Glycan arrays, which I represent, of course. So what I would like to tell you is that there are things called beam search arrays where you just release all the glycans from a mucin. Could, there could be hundreds of structures on a mucin macromolecule. Or you could go to a whole tissue if you have enough material. And then what there's, as uh, Frederica said, the vast majority of those st structures, we don't know what they are. But what you can do is just simply fractionate them into, say, initially into 20, 30 fractions. We can analyze them for binding, for recognition as such. And then that's the primary array. Then you go to the secondary array where you pick out a reactor binder fraction. You fractionate that by established methods, and then you array them. You have to be patient. And then tertiary array, quaternary array, and we did this with a very commonly used mucin, porcine stomach mucin. And among hundreds of structures, we found a binder for uh, enteric viruses, rotaviruses, and the binder sequence was a kind of chain, a type 1 based chain, which hadn't been described in this well-studied mucin. So f starting with the total O-glycan population, we ended up with the binders for this virus, which can infect the pig as well as the human. So there are 
a long way, I mean, with, uh, approaches we can use to attack the elephant, to, to dis fragment the elephant. So one of the examples shown was this nice extractor, which looks at glycans in images. Has anybody just tried to run this on all the images in the open literature and see what comes out? And if the papers have it, puppetator find some glycan terms and images have some glycans, would this be worth it instead of looking at, at the other way, like make the curator do it? and then do it by hand, just do it for everything, and then see if afterwards there's maybe some curatable resource coming out of it. No, no, it's just if Puppetator says there's a sugar in this paper, are there any images in this paper, run this extractor on it and see if something comes out of it. So do it the other way around. First automate, then curate, instead of curate, then automate. Yeah, I was just going to say it's uh, not my tool, but from what I'm gleaned, it's quite good at the specific SNFG. But the problem that a lot of us face is that, you know, maybe they're doing it in Oxford notation, or they've changed the colors, or they've changed the shapes, or they've changed everything. So the goal is, I think, to use a tool like that on certain previous, potentially high throughput uh, use cases, and just try and beg and convince uh, current authors to not publish papers where there is a single source of truth that it appears only in a figure. Be it downstairs, we were talking about lots of uh, other biocurators having problems with NLP and natural language. Now you multiply that difficulty by a hundred or a thousand times if you have just an image. So essentially, this is for legacy things that are, have a specific format, in this case I would say SNFG or SNFG adjacent, and then just do everything manually, which is what we're currently doing. That's at least the way that we see it. And as in future have, like any other field, you know, genomics, proteomics, the actual sequence published in the paper and not just a picture of the sequence. Or a Klytuken ID instead of a sequence. Yeah, but uh, I mean, of course, glide to can ID, but just one quick thing is that um, you're right. You have see a structure, then we have to find out how that structure is described in the text. So we have been working for the last five years now with Vijay Shankar. He's a text mining person. And that's, by the way, extractor is done by Nathan, Nathan Edwards. So if you created something what is like a glycan dictionary of terms, not at all comprehensive, but it's a start. So we need that plus the image extractor so that Puptator could identify genes and mentions a bunch of other things. Then we have to normalize it to accessions, which already can be done to uniprot accessions and gene names and so on. And the same, we have to normalize the glycans and then move. So that's what we want to do. And we, we hope that it will take us one step Ahead. Uh, there was also a question there. Uh, okay. Uh, after. Sorry. I'll um, just a s short comment. Um, it's good to come to these unrelated uh, workshops because you just get educated and, and, and you find how they are related to what you do. Um, I, I just realized that we probably do glycans in Puptator, but we do it under the umbrella of chemicals because in mesh, they are under the chemical tree. Um, so they, you would need a little an addition so to find all the chemical uh, mentions in papers, so that's the way to work on Puptator. You will need a little restriction to go to glycans and probably continue with, uh, with, uh, with the image tool. Hi, uh, I just wanted to make a comment. So I'm Catherine Hayes, I work with Frederick and I curate glycans. And just that problem we were talking about, about drawing glycan structures. Um, so I think it's, this extractor tool is amazing. It's great, I just tried it there. So it's, it works to a certain extent. But I think what you're missing is the fact that <laughs> um, 
when those images are put in the paper, it means that someone already drew them. And therefore, there exists in a lab somewhere the string format that we need. So for me, the most frustrating thing I have is that I see a beautiful PDF picture with all of the glycans that I want to curate, and I redraw all of them. And I interpret what they wanted to put into the paper. But if, I mean, I think it's actually part of the Mirage guidelines that you upload your string structure as part of the submission, the manuscript submission, or the supplementary information. I mean, of course, it should be a Glytucan ID, but if I've come across two papers in the last two years that have Glytucan IDs, that's probably as many as I've, I, I've seen. But to, to kind of go back and try and extract the image out, it, I mean, of course, there's some value in that, but surely we should be trying to um, convince people to upload what they've already drawn because they've drawn these, because they put them in the paper. So, sorry, it's just my two pence worth. <laughs> Thanks. No, I think it's absolutely fine to get frustrated about that. Unfortunately, not everybody draws them in like a like workbench. There are these people with PowerPoint templates and Illustrator templates. There's no sequence to get from them. So I was just going to say exactly the same thing, because in chemistry there is the same issue. Um, so we, every time people talk about getting authors to do things to support bio NLP, the main problem is authors don't know ontologies. And it was interesting to be in the workshop this morning when people were saying, yeah, you know, we should get um, uh, authors to use uh, standard identifiers. Well, there isn't a standard identifier, actually, because you could ask them to use Uniprot, Emble, RevSec, whatever. So as long as we're not organized, we can't really expect authors to get organized. But I think chemistry is one of the few areas where you can actually do it, because like you said, there are tools to draw these things, and you can save them in standard formats, and then that just lives on somebody's computer, and like you say, you have to draw it. And we have exactly the same thing with all other different kinds of chemical structures as well. It's the only, I think probably one of the only things in biology where there is a tool to do it properly, and uh, instead of saving as a PNG and putting it in your PDF, you could have saved it as a Smiles or a MOL file and attached that as well, and we could have just mined that. Uh, so there's a really nice paper on this from Emma Shumansky and Evan Bolton for the journal of Cheminformatics on getting people to do things like putting Smiles in abstracts and just then we could just pass them out of abstracts and we wouldn't even need to get open access. Totally unrelated. Uh. Any other, any other for the same thing before I change? Okay. <laughs> so for the motif, you have, as you show, a list of uh, motifs that I guess are involved in binding proteins, right? Okay. Sorry? Okay. But are the, the, the names, uh, do they have like um, a stable ID? Okay, so uh, Nathan, ha okay, there, okay, there's names, right? That's what you find as not a unique name because that's why you had the synonyms and all this kind of stuff. And then Nathan gave them their own ID and then there's a Clyde Tukin ID for each of these motives. Okay, so you can use a Yes, so in the literature and then also manual created by expert that, you know, in the papers gave us these names. So I just have a question. Can we use that for define, describing those ID when describe that there's a side that binds a, a, a lichen? If there's a motif or a region, I should guess not a side. Okay. I guess we have. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So, nothing. <laughs> so, we are working on it already. Okay. Okay. I think, any other comments? Otherwise, I think, I think we ran a little long, but that's fine. It's a really good discussion. We appreciate everybody attending and giving us feedback. And look forward to the second workshop to happen at a time and place to be determined. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.